Hello, we're going to be using Noon Sitting Daily Prayer, page 296 in the Lutheran Service Book. Name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen to my prayer, O God, do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalm for today will be Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, on my holy hill. I will tell the decree the Lord had said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Psalm 2, if you're familiar with the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 2 is one of the major messianic Psalms, the one that's looking forward to the Messiah, the one who will be uh, king over the nation of Israel forever and ever, uh, God setting him up in authority. Uh, I think it's fitting song, even though I'm just cycling through the Psalms as I continue th through uh, the book of Leviticus. Uh, it's, it's fitting for this passage, because as we will see, uh, much like the burnt offering in Leviticus chapter 1, Leviticus chapter 2, talking about the grain offering, will very much look forward to Christ and uh, how we understand him within a greater theological context. So, I'll be reading through the text of Leviticus chapter 2. Uh, much like Leviticus chapter 1 is going to seem a little dry to us because it's just giving you a whole bunch of regulations for how to, well, perform a, a specific action. So that's not necessarily exciting to a lot of people in Western cultures today, especially since, well, all our media is now geared more towards entertainment than it is for information or anything of the sort. Even uh, news outlets aren't really giving news anymore. They're giving fascinating stories so that, to intrigue us. But uh, when we actually get into the biblical text, uh, we'll see exactly what God wants to happen here, and we can apply this to our lives and faith. So, uh, Leviticus chapter 2. When someone brings a grain offering to the Lord, his offering is to be of fine flour. He is to pour oil on it, put incense on it, and take it to Aaron's sons, the priests. The priests shall take a handful of the fine flour and oil, together with all the incense, and birth this as a memorial portion on the altar, an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the offerings made to the Lord by fire. If you bring a grain offering baked in an oven, it is to consist of fine flour, cakes made without yeast and mixed with oil, or wafers made without yeast and spread with oil. If your grain offering is prepared on a griddle, it is to be made of fine flour mixed with oil and without yeast. Crumble it and pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. If your grain offering is cooked in a pan, it is to be made of fine flour and oil. Bring the grain offering made of these things to the Lord. Present it to the priest, who shall take it to the altar. 
You shall take out the memorial portion from the grain offering and burn it on the altar as an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons, is a most holy part of the offerings made to the Lord by fire. Every grain offering you bring to the Lord must be made without yeast, for you are not to burn any yeast or honey in an offering made to the Lord by fire. You may bring them to the Lord as an offering of the first, of the first fruits, but they are not to be offered on the altar as a pleasing aroma. Season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all of your offerings. If you bring a grain offering of first fruits to the Lord, offer crushed heads of new grain roasted in fire. Put oil and incense on it. It is a grain offering. The priest shall burn the memorial portion of the crushed grain and the oil, together with all the incense, as an offering made to the Lord by fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So before we get into some of the theological implications of the text, I really want to go through what's actually being done, what's the bare bones of this, and some of the uh, immediate meaning, meanings to the text, because you can read Leviticus on a number of different levels. There's the, well, all the practical level, what are you doing? There's more the ceremonial level, so what does this mean in terms of the overall rite, the, the uh, religious ceremony? And then you can also say, well, what is this doing for you specifically at this time in the nation of Israel? So what is, why is the nation of Israel doing this for themselves? And then you can also say, well, what is this actually pointing forward to? Because the pointing forward to would always point towards Jesus Christ and how this is fulfilled in him. So bare bones, what is actually going on? So certain sacrifices, certain offerings made at certain times of year, certain uh, ceremonies, you need to offer a grain offering. Now, the grain offering is not just you handing over a whole bunch of grain, like you're not just plucking out of the field, putting it in a basket, and then putting that basket at the tabernacle, the, the temple, sorry, the, the tent. <laughs> uh, the tabernacle is the tent where these sacrifices are offered. It's the center of worship and also the center of the Israelite community. So you're not just putting a whole bunch of stuff you just plucked from the field uh, there. You're, you're actually processing this a bit. Now, there's um, some lack of processing in one of the others, because verse 14 is talking about a grain offering of first fruits to the Lord. Uh, you're offering crushed heads of new grain roasted in the fire. So put oil and incense on it. It is a grain offering. So um, that's not baked into bread, into cakes. But it is uh, definitely processed in some way. It, it's not you just plucking one thing and putting it there. It's you actually putting some effort into it. Because this is a sacrifice. A sacrifice actually needs to have something more along with it. Um, there is actually a couple... Well, one in, one, one in particular that I can remember, where I believe it was King David who has offered um, uh, animals to sacrifice for God, and he was just given these animals, and David says, oh, far be it from me that, that I should sacrifice something which cost me nothing. Because the idea, the idea of sacrifice is that it actually has to be a sacrifice. And if you're bringing stuff from the field... Yeah, you're sacrificing some of that, but you're sacrificing something that is prepared for a purpose uh, because you're not necessarily just eating the grain on its own. Like some of the poor people within Israel, they might be doing that because they lack the means uh, such as an oven or maybe even money for oil. So they lack the means to, to bake cakes of bread, but it's not as though uh, they're... Um, uh, that uh, the person offering... Things would just uh, be somebody who would uh, eat grain straight straight from the field. There, there would be some processing. Because uh, the daily bread that the people would have would actually be made from the grain. You'd actually process it. So if you're thinking about what you're consuming, what is actually sustaining your life, this is what needs to be offered. And it can be something as basic as 
the grain offering with crushed heads some new grain roasted in the fire so something that it's uh, made uh, uh, somewhat pleasing through through this th through this cooking and then you also put oil and incense on it so you're preparing it for something more um, yeah th this is not just you offering bare grain this is you offering something that you would normally eat similar to the animals where you're not just burning an animal alive you're actually cutting this apart at, and offering the individual part separately uh, it is processed and understood as something that you would normally consume the the consumption of this is what you're sacrificing you're, you're not feeding yourself you're offering what is normally sustaining your body to god with that in mind there's a few instances here where it is made in made into cake so there's something uh, added to it um, but the the grain offerings should not have yeast or honey in an offering by fire so something burnt on the altar and all of the offerings even the ones that aren't burnt on the fire all the cannot contain yeast now honey would be an additive to make things sweet make things uh, delectable but if you're uh, sacrificing honey well that's kind of missing the point of the bread the bread is what is sustaining you the honey is kind of more of an add-on um, and if it's sacrificed to the Lord by fire he wants the thing as it is not just uh, adulterated in that way and the exception of this would be the salt because God also says he has a provision in here verse 13 season all your grain offerings with salt do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings add salt to all your offerings and you go like salt of the covenant that's that's interesting um well the salt is more representative of the saltiness of god's law that this isn't that you're not just living as an unabashed pagan that you're actually living according to the covenant of god uh, the the laws that he has given to you and he's currently giving to you in leviticus so you actually are seasoned yourself. You're made tasteful by having God season you. You are not unseasoned. You're not just raw. You actually have God in your life. In the New Testament, I get, you can sort of connect this to a couple instances where Jesus is talking about uh, the disciples being salt. In fact, this occurs in... Uh, three locations, one in Mark, one at Matthew, one in Luke. And you go like, oh, well, three different locations. Well, if it's Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it must be talking about the same story. No, actually it isn't. Because Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about salt, but in completely different locations, or, or completely different times in Jesus' ministry. So this is probably a saying of Jesus that he has over and over again, and just breaks, uh, brings it out at different times, just to illustrate certain points. Um, the one in Matthew, for example, uh, when when Jesus is bringing up uh, salt, he's talking to the disciples. You're the salt, or yeah, the disciples on the Sermon of the Mount, and then Sermon of the Mount. There's a lot more people there, but Jesus is specifically talking to the disciples, and then we're going to lose a lot. Anyways, uh, Jesus is saying to them that they're the salt of the earth. If you lose your saltiness, how can you be salty again? Uh, it's not good for anything, let it be thrown out. So the saltiness is well, God actually season, seasoning your life. If they are the salt of the earth, they're seasoning it, they're making it tasteful, they're making it pleasing unto the Lord because uh, it is reflecting him, it's reflecting his goodness and grace. So if you're living as a disciple, you're supposed to be living according to the law. So when you're seasoning the bread and offering it up in uh, whatever whatever uh, ceremony you have, whether it's on the altar or uh, just con prepared for consumption by the priest, uh, this is uh, this is always going to be seasoned with salt because this is representative of God in your life, uh, in the lives of the people. The honey is for, as a sacrifice, yeah, it's, the honey is kind of something that God gives to you as something sweet. In, in fact, it comes up uh, when you're talking about the promised land, the land of milk and honey. 
So this is God's grace given to you. And yes, you could offer it up as a sacrifice, as, that, that this is something good and pleasing to God. But uh, if you're adding honey to something, to make it sweet to the taste, well, God doesn't need anything else. He just wants the bread. Because the bread itself is representing more the people, the nation. Um, uh, when we're talking about, or in the New Testament as well, we're not just talking about, well, a meal. We're talking about something that sustains you, something that gives you life. And really, it is that which keeps the, uh, the people going. Uh, you can borrow the old phrase, uh, an army marches on its stomach. So if you're without bread, then you don't have a people anymore. You don't have... You, you need food to sustain it. So the people are understood as the bread. And I'll be getting into that a little bit more after I talk about yeast. But uh, the bread, or the grain offering, or in, in, it's made into cakes or not made into cakes, the, the grain offering is representative more of the people, who they are, and their lives. So if you're offering it on the altar, you don't need to sweeten it, because if you're trying to sweeten it, then you're trying to say, well, I'm doing a little bit extra for God in my sacrifice to him. You don't need the extra sacrifice. He, he just wants you. So if you're preparing anything with honey, it can't be offered uh, on the altar with the fire, because God doesn't need it. But you can definitely give that to uh, your neighbors, na namely the priests, because that would be delightful for them. God doesn't need it, they might like it. And if you're, and if we're viewing this as something added on, something sweeter, well, you can also say, well, maybe it could resemble good works. I'm not saying it does, but if you, but we can think about it as, well, if you're adding something to our offering of ourselves to our neighbors, such as the priest, well, then you're offering uh, your good works in service to them, so they would actually enjoy this. So you're not just offering yourself, but you're offering um, more than what is expected of you. This is how good works actually work. Where God doesn't need our good works. We're not giving anything to him by having good works. We're not depriving him of anything by withholding our good works. God is not hurt or benefited by our good works. He is himself infinite. He has all things. So... We cannot add anything to him, nor can we subtract it. If we're looking to good works, good works are for the benefit of our neighbors and also ourselves to a degree. Because if we're doing good works, such as like in the uh, first table of the law, we're, we're looking to having no other gods before us, if we're looking to not misusing the name of the Lord, if we're looking to remember the Sabbath day, well, these things are how we have a proper relationship with God, of course, but in having a proper relationship with God, we are actually benefiting from it. Because if we are living according to the faith, then we will receive the all the blessings of the faith, namely, like, remembering the Sabbath day. Well, then we get the Sabbath rest, contemplation on God's word, and remember that we, all, we are the salt of the earth, and we have all these blessings of God. So this is good for us to contemplate and even to respond um, with sacrifices of praise in worship. For, for uh, the second commandment, do not misuse the name of the Lord. Well, the name of the Lord is given so that we may call upon him in prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. So always praying on the name of the Lord. This is, again, for our benefit. Like, God is not benefited by our prayers. We are the only ones who can benefit by our prayers. Uh, namely, because... When we pray to God, we are living in the relationship of faith, and he is actually listening to us. So when we pray, God's grace is given to us. Not that we're doing a work of prayer in order to receive grace, but grace, sorry, prayer is naturally flowing out of faith, because this is just what we do. If you're in faith, you do this. And having this living relationship with God, God gives you grace upon grace. So you don't work for grace, but God still gets it. <laughs> it's, my, it's my point. Anyways, 
Uh, but also having God's name upon you means living as a Christian. Christ's name is upon you as a Christian. So if you're living as one whom God has redeemed through Christ, and not misusing the name of the Lord that way, saying that you're a Christian when you're obviously not living as a Christian. Yeah, uh, uh, living according to God's name will actually benefit you again, because even though uh, you're doing works in that sense, you're following the law, you're not experiencing any harm from violating the law, living an unabashed pagan lifestyle, uh, which is free to harm you in a in bodily in a bodily manner or spiritual manner psychological manner mental etc 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 and um, the first commandment you shall have no other gods yes this is the ultimate one the one that's pointing you in, in the proper direction if you do have other gods then how can they save you so uh yes following the commandments you actually benefit With the second table of the law, the commandments looking to your neighbors, you are now treating them properly. So, you know, the ones who are benefiting by your good works according to the law. So this is what I mean when we're talking about good works, which it does not improve God, nor does it detract from him, but it can only help to serve you and your neighbors. This is why God has put forward the law, so that all, all of creation may work together for all of creation's benefit. That's why we have good works, is so that everybody may live in God's goodness and grace as he originally designed the world to be before it fell into sin. So God does not need honey. Your neighbor might. <clears throat> but the yeast, the yeast is something else. Because if we're talking about yeast, yeast is that which rises, okay? And you only need a little yeast, and it will leaven the entire lump. All the, the, the bread that you have, it will, it will rise completely, and you don't need that much yeast to do it. Um, yeast itself is the bacterial component. It's creating um, uh, gas with it. In the bread, which is what causes it to rise uh, in heat. So we know this chemically, but what does this really mean? Well, it, it's actually representative of sin. And when Jesus is talking about uh, yeast in the New Testament, where he's the one who says, a little yeast leavens the entire lump, uh, he is speaking about sin. And at that time, most notably the, the sin of the Pharisees. So you, you have the Pharisees having this little sin where they're at, and then the entire nation of Israel kind of blows up with this particular hypocrisy that the Pharisees have. So Jesus, when he's doing his ministry, he really needs to war against hypocrisy because uh, through the teachings of the Pharisees, it is spread everywhere and people have misunderstood God's law. So Jesus has to correct this whole thing. But it's representative of sin also, where it's not just the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, but it's our own personal sin. So if you have one little sin, it can balloon to, well, gigantic proportions. Because if you have one sin, then you're broken off from the rest of God's law. You're broken off from God himself, violating the first commandment, because if you have other gods, but you have sinned against God, well, you're redirecting yourself away from him to, head, to look to yourself, making yourself your own God, your own lawgiver. And you have now corrupted yourself completely because now you've ha you have a broken relationship with God. This was what happened in the fall in the Garden of Eden, where there was one transgression, eating the forbidden fruit. And eating fruit doesn't sound like a big sin. In fact, most people eat fruit all the time. But it was that specific fruit which God had commanded not to be eaten. So there was a violation of God's command. People, uh, Adam and Eve desired to be God. Uh, God of their own lives, and they fell away. They completely destroyed themselves. They fell into death that day uh, because they had eaten of the fruit. Uh, they died spiritually, and by the grace of God, they wouldn't die physically immediately, but that would come later on. Now, uh, with 
uh, with us, we can also conceive of small sins, maybe even white lies, and then these can balloon out of proportion. Uh, with with a scriptural example, um, usually this is related to coveting. And there's a co two, two major passages where we talk about coveting. One would it'd be uh, Naboth's vineyard. Naboth was a faithful man to God. He had a vineyard. Uh, King Ahab desired this vineyard, coveted it, and uh, he basically allowed all sorts of horrible things to happen in order to obtain it. So this one sin of coveting kind of ballooned out to really destroy the rest of uh, Ahab's relation with God. Of course, it was all, King Ahab was also a terrible guy, so it was all it was ruined beforehand. But yeah, God, after after this event with Naboth, declared that Ahab would die. Uh, it was not pleasant. Uh, King David, also with Bathsheba, uh, King David coveted, lusted after this woman that he saw uh, bathing herself, and then after after that he broke basically every other commandment, <laughs> uh, where um, he actively committed adultery with her uh, when he found out she was pregnant. Uh, he tried to get her her husband to to have relations with her so that they could claim that he was the father of the baby when he wouldn't because he was too loyal to King David. David betrayed him, um, kind of deceived the nation in, in how he killed, had this one guy killed, so, so he was also at fault for killing. Um, then he took his, the, um, uh, Bathsheba for himself, so he was kind of stealing her away as well. Uh, Many, many things. Uh, you, if you want to go through the entire story, you will find that David basically breaks every single commandment. <laughs> um, arguably even uh, coveting, coveting his neighbor's household, since household re relates to uh, the inheritance, uh, which he deprived uh, Bathsheba's husband of having by having him uh, killed uh, without an heir. Anyways, so King David, just by lusting after a woman, completely destroyed himself, completely went against the Ten Commandments, and uh, if he had died uh, in his sin, he would have been damned for all of eternity because he was fully corrupt. Uh, it's only by the grace of God that he was convicted of his sin and repented of it, and this is where we get Psalm 51. It's the, that's David's repentance when he realized just how terrible he was in the sight of God. Uh, it's also why we pray Psalm 51 uh, all the time, because, well, Psalm 51 really talks about, well, how sinful are we? And we realize that even if we do have only one sin away from God, um, then we are still violating uh, his law and have removed ourselves from him. So every sin corrupts us and brings us to death. So no yeast. If you're offering something to God, it cannot be with sin. It cannot be leavened by sin. It must be pure, according to its contents. Uh, another little thing I wanted to put in here, um, or mention, is the incense. So that there's uh, mixing with oil, mixing with incense. Uh, the oil is a little bit more uh, basic, because oil, how are you going to make bread without oil? That's, that's basically it. You just put oil uh, on your food. It's also represented of uh, land of plenty, also of the sacrifice, because you're sacrificing grain. This is your uh, standard food. Uh, oil is what usually keeps it together, so you're also sacrificing that along with it. Uh, but oil also looks to a land of plenty where if you if you were eating well at this time, you would also be eating oil. So similar to, uh, to the grains, it, it, that's why you'd be sacrificing it. Uh, the incense, though, that's interesting because you don't normally want to eat incense. You don't necessarily want to eat that particular spice uh, when you're doing that, uh, when you're eating food, because it's not made to be a spice per se. <laughs> In fact, this is a particular type of spice that God had, com or, yeah, well, I guess you could say spice, but specific type of incense that God had uh, declared the people to make specifically for worship at the temple. So this actually happens in the book of Exodus where God is giving a whole bunch of commands for proper worship with him. 
The incense is of a very particular kind, and it is basically de designating this food for a very specific purpose, which is a sacrifice in holiness. So everything related to this incense is for a holy purpose. Okay. Next up, Aaron and his sons. They're mentioned many, many times here. <laughs> so what's up with that? Um, why, do you, why do you have Aaron and his sons being mentioned many times? Well, Aaron, he's the high priest at this time. He's the first high priest of the nation of Israel. But he's also going to be the father, according to God's own command, of all the other high priests. So when Aaron and his sons are eating these things, this is really referring to the priests in general, but also a little bit more specifically Aaron's household, because we're looking to this uh, sustaining the priesthood. Now, for very practical purposes, this is how the, the, the tribe of Levi and the nation of Israel actually sustains itself, because uh, the tribe of Levi is designated to be a land of priests. They don't or a tribe of priests, I mean, they don't get any land uh, in the, in, when everybody settles Israel because they're supposed to be scattered everywhere. They have their own small little communities, but they don't really get their own particular land. This is because they're supposed to be acting as the intermediaries between God and man at this time. And uh, they are supposed to be for the rest of the tribes of Israel. So they're kind of set apart for a holy purpose. Uh, not just tilling the field. For, for them, though, this means that they completely depend on all the offerings made to the temple because if you don't have any land, how are you going to sustain yourself with food? You're just not. So they're dependent on the sacrifices at the tabernacle and then later on the temple in, in Jerusalem because certain uh, sacrifices allow them to eat the contents. So with certain uh, sacrifices of animals, they can eat parts of it. With certain, with, with certain grain offerings, they can eat the grain offerings. And this is really how, how they can live, how they get their wages is by working as priests in the nation of Israel. So uh, their situation is actually a bit, little bit more precarious than some of the other tribes because the other tribes, while well, they can always fall back onto the, on their land, uh, on farming. Uh, during famines is a little bit hard, of course, but they always have the promise that God gives them that he will give them blessing in the land. The priests are in a little bit more precarious position because they don't have any land where they're receiving this. What they actually have is they have all the people in the land giving them stuff if the people are unrepentant, if they're not living according to God's commandments, then they do not eat. So you do also have a little bit of motivation for the priests to try and uh, get everybody to live good and holy lives. Uh, but the basic, the basic understanding is that they are completely dependent on God for their livelihood. Now, if you talk to farmers, of course, they would also say the same thing. They're completely dependent on God to give the right conditions for them to grow crops so that they can live. Uh, farmer, if you have... A couple good crops, or a couple good uh, years out of about uh, eight or nine, I think it is, then you're, you'll be able to feed yourself and your family. But you recognize that if something turns south, well, they, they might not survive. The family might not survive. They may have to give up uh, their land and their farm. In fact, this is one of the uh, main themes in the Book of Ruth, is uh, where people are separated from their land and they just, because of famine and they just uh, can't live. So they need to depend on God even more at that time. Anyway, so this is also why we have consumption by the priest, but what does this really say going forward? So I talked quite a bit about, well, uh, what's actually going on. So you have people giving, sacrificing their daily bread to God at the temple, the, uh, made with various forms. The priests are actually eating this. Uh, 
We also have kind of more of the ceremonial aspect of this where it's sustaining the priests as well as uh, offering sacrifices from the understanding of the people. Uh, we'll get into all the particulars of the various reasons where you give a grain offering as we continue throughout the book of Leviticus. I won't go through all the festivals here, but it is, I'll mention the festival of first fruits a little bit later on. So next level, <laughs> theological implications. So I talked quite a bit about, well, why are you giving this specifically? The, the bread represent, or the grains are prepared as cakes or as uh, crushed heads for a first fruits offering. Uh, this is representing the people, so they're offering themselves. The salt represents them actually being uh, salted by God, them actually living according to God's goodness, according to his commands, being with him. Uh, the honey, can, I'm guessing, and again, this isn't, this isn't necessarily the case, but the honey representing more good works. So not necessarily offered to God, but it is offered to the neighbors, the priests who are consuming this. Uh, the yeast representing sin. So you're not supposed to offer sin to God because that is abhorrent to him. So do not. Uh, if you do, you will be destroyed. This is also why when we come to communion, you are to examine yourself, confess your sins, so that you may receive absolution um, in the meal itself. Because if you come to God retaining your sin, God will judge you according to your sin. It's not good. So now, how does this all point to Christ? Well, I was mentioning Christ's words at a few different times already, but really what this is supposed to point us towards is the body of Christ. And I mean that in a couple different senses. Because the body of Christ is his flesh. But the body of Christ, as we see in other places in the New Testament, especially in uh, 1 Corinthians, in chapter uh, 10 and 11, uh, kind of intermixed with the idea of the actual flesh of Christ, is the body of Christ being the people of God. Now, the people of God, that, that's more of the meaning here in Leviticus chapter 2, but it's always pointing forward to Jesus, who, when, he, when people are united to him in faith, they are his body. They're the ones whom Christ is with. So, we, so if uh, Christ is with us in faith, then we are his body. Uh, he uses us to do good works for our neighbors, for the, for the creation. And this is just God working through means. In the beginning, God worked through the word. Jesus Christ this was the word that spoke all things into existence. So using the medium of a word, the creation existed, and now he's sustaining the creation in a very different sense by coming to us so that we may be his body and help one another as uh, as he directs us to do. So as Christ would save and help others, so we are to save and help others. Uh, always professing the word of Christ so that they may be recreated in Christ and brought to faith. <clears throat> but the important aspect is also Christ's own body. This is <clears throat> this is his flesh given to be consumed by the people. Now we'll get more into the uh, consumption aspect of things when we get to Leviticus chapter 3, the fellowship offering, because that's a bit more of a major feature. But with the grain offering, uh, what's actually happening is it's being consumed to be among the people. So this, this grain offering was prepared for the holy purpose. That's why we have the incense in there. And Jesus is prepared for a holy purpose so that it may be consumed in a proper setting. Uh, the, the way that this works out throughout salvation history is that it was reserved for the priest, but it moves out to the people, especially when we, we talk about communion. 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, which is using the body of Christ not only as the people, the community of faith, but also the body of Christ as the actual body of Christ offered in the bread. But I'll talk more about that um, when, we, when we move on. What I want to focus on here a little bit more is uh, 
and I mean like move on in, in the book, this green offering comes up again. <laughs> what I want to talk about here a little bit more is uh, Jesus being the bread from heaven. So Jesus declares this, John chapter 6, and he explains that he is the bread of, of heaven. If anybody feasts on him, then you have eternal life. So Jesus is the bread. When you're offering grain in the form of bread or, or the uh, crushed heads of the new grain roasted in fire, what you're doing is you're offering Christ in your place. Much like with the burnt offerings in Leviticus chapter 1, where you're offering an animal in your place, a sacrificial animal in your place, so that that animal dies and not yourself, the grain offering is that which is burned and consumed instead of you being consumed by the fires of God, the judgment of God and his punishment. So you're giving of your sustenance back to God, recognizing that this is, uh, that you've received the blessing of the bread, but you're also recognizing when you're going forward this, that this is the Messiah, the one who is to, to be offered in your place. He is the one who sustains you, yes. Uh, he is also the one who is sacrificing your behalf, but yeah, more importantly, he's the one who sustains you in the faith. Because if we're talking about bread, well, this is more easily sh shared with other people. Uh, in fact, grain offerings, large portion of it is expected to be consumed by the priest, consumed by the people. So Christ, when he's talking about, I am the true bread that has come from heaven, he's really pointing to, well, how have you fed in the past? Where is your sub sustenance? If your sustenance is just bare bread, well then, as bare bread perishes and, and, and is destroyed, so to you will perish and destroy, be destroyed in death. But Jesus, as the true bread from heaven, he is the one who feeds you unto eternal life. Feasting on Christ means that you are without fear of death. He is the one who sustains you. And of course, this is manifest in the Lord's Supper, uh, but this can, can also be done through faith. John chapter 6 is more about a spiritual eating, spiritual consumption of Christ. It's, uh, John chapter 6 is definitely pointing towards the Last Supper, pointing towards uh, communion, but we're also feasting on Christ spiritually through faith. When Christ comes to us, uh, when he declares himself to be the, to be the bread of life, we have to we recognize that our sustenance isn't in the things of the world, but it's in heaven. It's the one who has come down from heaven so that we may be saved. So, <laughs> um, as, as the priests would be consuming the true bread and being sustained in that way as a holy gift of God, so Jesus Christ as the holy gift of God to us actually sustains us as the true bread. Amen. Uh, let us continue, page 296, with the Kyrie. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, who bread from heaven, feed and sustain us in our walk of faith in this life and to life everlasting. Amen. And Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to direct and rule us according to your will, to comfort us in all our afflictions, to defend us from all error, to lead us into all truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> 